from the bottom of my heart, we shout aloud. together for the Lord. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the adoration. Thank him for bringing us into a new month. Thank him that we can dance. Thank him that we can rejoice. Thank him that we are not in the hospital this morning. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. We give him glory. Give him honor. I appreciate him. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. For his compassion, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great has been the faithfulness of our God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Great is the Lord, and is greatly to be praised. Worship him, honor him, adore him. Oh, glory, 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 glory be to your holy name. Thank you for our hands that can clap. Thank you for our mouth that can shout hallelujah. We give you glory, we give you honor. We just want you to know that we are grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my Savior. Hallelujah, Lord. Darling Jesus, darling Jesus. Oh my darling Jesus, you're a wonderful God. I love you so much, darling Jesus. Oh my darling Jesus, you're a wonderful God. Somebody shout it really loud, hallelujah. Our Father, we thank you. A thousand of tongues will not be enough to praise you. 
For all that you have done for us as individuals, as families, and as a church, we thank you, Lord. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you all the adoration. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, our Savior, our advocate, the bread of life, the chief cornerstone, deliverer, Emmanuel, first and the last, the good shepherd, the holy one of Israel, the I am that I am, Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lamb of God, the nearest friend. Oh, we worship your majesty. Glory, 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 glory be to your holy name. Thank you, Lord, that this morning we are in the sanctuary and not in the mortuary. Accept our thanksgivings in the name of Jesus. Thank you for bringing us into 2020. Thank you for January that is gone now. Thank you for this new month, February. Thank you because we are alive. Some saw January, but they are not in February. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you all the adoration. Please just be glorified in the name of Jesus. Bless our tithes and offerings. Bless all the, donation, the donations towards the 14th anniversary of the church. I pray, Lord, that this morning you will send your word to us. Your word will encourage us. Your word will comfort us. Your word will challenge us. Your word will change us. Your word will heal us. Your word will destroy destructions. And we promise that we shall return all the glory back to you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Blessed be your name forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Let everyone who is grateful to be alive put his or her hands together for the Lord. Make it loud, make it great. Celebrate Jesus. Clap louder than your neighbor. All oh, glory, glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. And God bless you. May please be seated. Let's appreciate the choir. That was a pleasant beautiful surprise <laughs> glory be to god wow if we share the grace now it will have been a great thanksgiving service that was really great thank you very much for being so mightily used of god well i welcome us to the month of february month by month you are going to be better and better in the mighty name of jesus Isaac turned three months yesterday. <laughs> Glory be to God. <laughs> Our theme for the month of February is rest on every side. Somebody will enjoy rest on every side. In the mighty name of Jesus. While you are seated, let's take our prophetic scripture for this entire year. It's from Leviticus 25. Verse 12, and we take our prophetic declaration. I want to go. For it is the Jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. This is my year of Jubilee. Everything is turning around for my good, and it's jubilation all the way in Jesus' name. If you receive that, let your amen be a louder amen. Our, th our text. For well, this morning and this whole month, uh, we first Kings chapter five. We'll read the first five verses. First Kings five, one to five. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David, and Solomon sent to Hiram, saying. Thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God, for the walls which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God had given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. Let your amen be a resounding amen. amen. Verse 5, And behold, I propose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. 
It's very important to begin the teachings this month by explaining the key word, rest. You have to bring rest in context. Rest is the end of labor. Now, labor will end in somebody's life in the name of Jesus. It then becomes important to explain labor also. When labor, when someone is in labor, he works harder than others, but achieves little or nothing compared to others. That's labor. In Genesis 27, verses 1 and 2, Genesis 27, 1 and 2, Isaac was growing old, and so he, he called on Esau. So Esau, you are the firstborn. Can you go and find me some bushmeat and cook it like I want? So my soul could bless you. Esau said, yes, sir. And Esau ran out, labored. But Jacob was in the house, maybe having a siesta. And the mother said, Jacob, get up. Your father is about to release a blessing. Just go to the back of the house, bring some goats. Don't bother about cooking. I will cook it. Oh, who can cook better for your father than myself? I'll cook it for you. And so Rebecca, the mom, cooked the thing for Jacob, gave it to him. Now I'll go and give to your father. Now, before Isaac could eat the food, he saw the didn't come. While he was eating the food, he saw the didn't come. Because labor will keep you behind. So when Isaac finished the food and had released the blessing, then it's okay. That's how labor works. Labor delays a man until all blessings are gone. You will no longer labor. Because favor of God will be upon you from now in the name of Jesus. When someone is in labor, he is not appreciated for his efforts. The efforts may even lead him into trouble. I mean, picture a man whose manager had put a food on the table, a plate of food, and then the man noticed that some flies were dancing around the food and picked the food and took it to the kitchen and covered it. And the manager came, and who took my food? So I did, sir. Say, ah, so you are a thief? Say, no, I'm Flies were flying on it to say, no, you are fired. When someone is in labor, even his good works will turn to bad work. Where he should have been appreciated, he will not. To labor is a terrible thing. Nobody is willing to assist the man in labor. Whereas the people struggle to help the man at rest. When say, I'm okay, no, 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 let's, let's do it. Let's finish it for you. The man in labor, people are watching him, sweating. But not even members of his household are willing to help him. The yoke of labor is destroyed this month in the name of Jesus. No wonder Jesus says in his word, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Say, come, that I may give you rest. Labor is the opposite of rest. And rest is the opposite of labor. What others get done in weeks takes the man in labor years. The man in labor is almost getting it, but never gets it. Whereas the man at rest makes little effort for outstanding results. The man at rest gets into a task almost completed. And with little effort, he takes credit for the whole task. A manager in the office was given a task from January and he worked very hard. And the thing should have lasted 10 months. At the 11th month, he had not finished and the manager said, I don't think you know what you are doing. He said, no, I'm, 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 I will finish it, trust me. He said, no, I can't trust you. I found somebody else that will do it. So the guy was fired. But this man had done 99% of the work. The guy they got, got there, did one tiny thing, got the result. So you see, what that guy couldn't complete in 11 months. This guy came there in hours. But it was a completed job. 
That's what rest does. You're just going to be getting there when it's almost done, and when they need to give credit, it, it comes to you. And somebody will be at rest. Yeah. I can't hear your amen. Yeah. Anyone in labor is at war constantly. They are convicted for offense they never committed. They are accused wrongly. To be in labor is a terrible thing. You know, a, a story caught my attention early hours of this morning, and I, and I thought it would be a good illustration for this labor versus rest. The caption from BBC News says, three men freed from prison 36 years after they were wrongfully convicted of murder. 36 years. The story went on to say, three Baltimore men who spent 36 years in prison were released Monday after authorities say they were falsely convicted of a 1983 murder. Alfred Chestnut, Ransom Watkins, and Andrew Stewart were granted a writ of innocence after being convicted of first degree murder of a middle school student, Dewitt Duckett. And then when they asked him, he said, that was hell, Chestnut said of his experience in jail. That was miserable. Chestnut and Watkins were 16 at the time of their arrest, and Stewart was 17. The men are now in their early 50s, preparing to enter adulthood on the outside for the first time. At least two have never driven a car before. End of quote. Beloved, when a man is under the yoke of labor, even things he has not done, he will be accused. You are the one. Say, no, I'm not. I can't prove. Say, no, you are the one. May the yoke of labor be destroyed. Permanently so in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. In this foundation, I will try and be very brief this morning because I really want us to thank God. Rachel was not alive to enjoy the glory of her son Joseph in Egypt. She wept, she cried, she waited, and God blessed her with Joseph. Joseph was growing up, and Joseph, years after, became a prime minister in Egypt. What a glory of a mother! But Rachel had died. They will not give you one minute silence on the day of your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ. Jonathan labored in love for David, his friend. But was dead by the time David became the king. The life of Jonathan was war from beginning to the end. Imagine Jonathan alive when David had become a king. Of course he would have been deputy king. Labor demands more work and denies all rewards. A man in labor will leave a job for 10% pay rise just one month before a 50% salary adjustment by the previous employer and one month before current employer commences layoffs. So why did you hire me when you are going to start layoff? We didn't know. And the company he left had just done salary adjustment, 50% increase. The job he went to collect, only 10% rise. And he was there only one month. Raise your right hand and say, Father, destroy the yoke of labor permanently from my lives. In the name of Jesus, can I hear your amen? The man in labor cannot do what he desires to do for himself or for God. It will always be a dream because he's constantly at war. There are at least four categories of people. Number one, war on every side. That's what Solomon said of his father in verse 3, 1 Kings 5 verse 3. Say, my father, 
had wars all around him. Thank God for David, because that verse 3 says that God put all the enemies finally under, under his foot. Say, thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord is God. For the walls which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. See, until God will give a man rest is in labor. Everywhere war. Today is with his spouse. And when he's recovering, then his children. And then is the job. And then is the health. I, I pray one more time that every yoke of labor and warring and war, left, right, center, everywhere, let that yoke be destroyed this month. In the name of Jesus. Category number two, more of war than rest. You see that again in David. Because if you read in 2 Samuel 11, 1, the only one time that appeared that he wanted to rest, he got into trouble. Because it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him <laughs> and all Israel, and they destroyed, let's verse 2 with it, and destroyed the children of Ammon and Bessie Rabbat. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. But he landed in another war. Because that was when he committed sin with Bathsheba. So that was why the song concluded that for this man, it was war from beginning to the end. Category number three, more of rest than war. You find that in the story of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was confronted, and Judah was confronted with three mighty nations. And God helped Jehoshaphat to defeat this enemy, just like he will help you defeat all your enemies this month. In the name of Jesus. But then the Bible put in summary the life of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 and in verse 30. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 30 says, So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet. For his God gave him rest round about. After he overcame the challenge of these three nations, his God now gave him rest round about. That will be your testimony after now. In the name of Jesus. And then, of course, category number four is rest on every side. I can hear two good amen. I can hear five now, but we are more than five. Because that will become our testimony in the name of Jesus. So in 1 Kings 5 verse 4, Solomon testified. Can you see how oh my God has given me rest on every side? And he explained it. He says, so there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. Not that they are not existing, but they dare not come near. God will give you rest in the name of Jesus. So I begin to conclude. What's the path? To rest. We have a month ahead of us to look at this. So I will just bring some summary or introduction if you like this morning. Number one, I call it paved ways. Paved ways. Paved ways. David paved the way for Solomon. If you inherit a rocky road, or a muddy road, the journey of life will be full of labor. Every battle that Solomon will have needed to fight, David fought all. For some of us, our parents handed over battle, almost from birth. The way was not paved for David, the father of Solomon. It was a war zone full of neglect. When the prophet came, to anoint a king. It, it was David the prophet came for, but David was suffering from neglect. He was fighting lions and fighting bears. David didn't have a paved way to ride on. Complex spiritual background creates potholes in the journey of life. I mean, you imagine a sister, but I had a testimony in camp. Some of you probably had also some years back. When she was a teenager, 
She liked running around boys, so the mother was a bit afraid. So the mother took her to one abali somewhere and said, please, give me, do a charm for this girl so that no man, no man will ever love her. So that when she grows up and she's now a graduate, ready to get married, then we change it. That men will now begin to love her. Unfortunately, when they did that, or, and of course, no, no man loved her. No boy moved near her to say, be my girlfriend. As it were, the thing worked. But now, when she graduated, so that they can change the thing, so that now men could love her, the man who did it had died. So at 35, no man came to her, will you marry me? She got married close to 40. Because finally she knew that there, there must be a problem somewhere. And in the place of prayers, the word came. She so go and ask your mother. She will tell you. Went to the mother. The mother said, hey, I've just been afraid to tell you it's true. This is what we did. It's okay, mama, that's fine. I've forgiven you. At least now I know that something was tied somewhere. Because the mother said they threw the thing away. So they now knows now knew how to pray and say, Lord, you were there when they did what they did. Please turn around what they did. That same year, the yoke was broken. Labor gave way for rest. And then she got married. By the time she was sharing her testimony, she has already gotten a child. Every rocky background, every muddy road that you have had to walk, to journey, the almighty God himself, the father of the fatherless, we've paved ways for you now in the name of Jesus. When a man is on a journey on paved ways, everything moves up. A pastor was saying something very humorously, but so true, that he went to a minister somewhere, and there's another man that is, uh, I think, the fourth in the in, in fourth generation of pastors from, you know, in his own family. And I, he noticed that he has to fast and pray and then when everybody went to eat breakfast, he wasn't joining them. The other guest speaker ate breakfast, ate lunch. <laughs> and when the man showed up in the evening, the heavens were open. Ah, I was wondering, at, what's, what's wrong with me? And then the Lord explained it to him. That this man, they began to pray for him from the generation before. The parents woke up, they anointed him. They spoke to his life. You, you were born a Muslim. The kind of word they spoke to your life, it took salvation to get you this far. And so now, <laughs> to break through to heaven, you have to. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Every rocky part, the Almighty God will reconstruct the way. Amen. Let me hear your loud amen. amen. That's why. There are some things you yourself know that except you really fight hard, things don't move. Because the road is rocky. Complex family background creates odds in the race of life. I mean, you know, imagine a, a young girl that the mother died when she was born. And the father, so insensitive, looked at her one day and say, look at you, after all, you are the one that killed your mother. And the girl said, really? And she went and asked the, the siblings. I said, yes, you killed mom. And from that day, a spirit of sorrow entered her. Joy was far from her. She grew up without sorrow, like a murderer. There are words that we have said that had entered the spirit, the soul. And some of us are victims of such words. And is fighting our destiny. You wonder how some people behave the way they behave. Be careful before you judge anybody. You have to know their story. There are many people you complain about that you should be praying for. If only you know the entire story. 
Complex family background creates odds in the race of life. I mean, imagine a child born in a terrible polygamous home where there is civil war all the time. She, she grew up fearful. And if he's a male, ah, he can't trust anyone. Because the mother told him every day that that other woman will kill you because you are the only boy. Don't leave your food unattended. Grew up in fear. And fear is torment. David paved way for Solomon. And so Solomon could say, I have rest on every side. May I therefore tell us as parents, don't complicate the future of your own children. Pave the way for them instead. Wake up in the morning, speak grace to their land. Stand up in the night and walk to their room and pray for them. Pick a day of the week and say, this is the day I'm fasting for my children. Before she begins to know bad behavior. I pick Wednesday, I pick Friday, I will fast. Pave the way. Pave the way for them in school. My child will not be enticed to join any gang. Pick a day and pray. Pave the way, pay the price. Oh, I know you didn't enjoy that, but must your children go through the same rocky road? Proverbs 13, verse 22, the A part. Proverbs 22, 13, 22, the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Don't leave trouble for your children. Generations are linked for same pattern of labor until a man of rest breaks the chain. And if there's labor in your family lineage, you are the one to break it. Amen. Let me hear a loud amen. amen. You know, please, let's pave ways for our children. I stumbled on another, another story. In fact, that one was, I was surprised when I saw the, the caption. But the caption says, and baby makes three generations in U.S. prison. So I said, ah, they, did they jail babies? Then I read for that, I found out what had happened. You know, Tammy, a grandmother, spotting tattoos, has been in and out of jail throughout her daughter's life. She was already incarcerated for robbery when Nikki joined her almost two years ago for identified fraud. Nikki learned she was pregnant when she came to prison. It was her second child, but she lost custody of a daughter born when she was 16. So three generations in prison. Grandmother, the mother, and the baby at the same time. What kind of road is this boy traveling? Muddy or girl, or is he boy? You know, you know, muddy road, rocky road. A baby in prison with the grandmother and the mother at the same time. Just picture that. If the way paved for you is rocky or muddy, you need another way. Thank God, John 14, 16 says Jesus is the way. The way we make way for us. In the name of Jesus. If the way paved for you is wonderful, well, you need the wonderful to maintain the wonderful way. Because a good road can get bad. Isaiah 9 verse 6. So unto us a child was born, unto us a son was given, and his name shall be called Wonderful. If the way you are riding on, you are joining us, already wonderful. You need the wonderful, Jesus Christ, to keep it wonderful. So either way, you need the way. If the road is muddy and rocky, you need the way. If the road is wonderful, you need the way. Second point in conclusion. How do I walk the path of rest on every side? The first point is paved ways. The second point is call for divine attention. A call for divine attention. Solomon got divine attention through sacrifice. He needed God to pay attention to him. And he said, what will I do? Let me do something that is not common. So he went in 2 Chronicles 1, 6 and 7. 2 Chronicles 1, 6 and 7. 
and offered a thousand bond offering. The Bible says, and Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation, and offered a thousand bond offerings upon it. In verse 7, he got the attention of God. In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. When the road you are traveling on is rocky and muddy, you must call the attention of God. Even if it's a paved way, you need God's attention. Blind Bartimaeus got divine attention through prayers. In Mark 10, from 46 to 52. Mark 10, 46 to 52. Blind Bartimaeus screamed and said, Jesus, in verse 47, I believe, and said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. When you cry for mercy, consistently, persistently, we have been fasting now, I don't know how many days again, 24 days or 23 days. How many days have we come to pray? Some people pray only during emergency. When something had happened, you suddenly get emotional. So they come. And after a few days, they, they go back. Those that must get the attention of God, they pray consistently, persistently, knocking on the door until God opens. If you go to somebody's door, you knock it once, he didn't answer. You knock second time, he didn't answer, you turn back. But you need something on inside. And somebody who came later after you, he said, I'm not living here. I know somebody is inside. And keeps knocking the door. Who do you think will get inside? Many of us, we knock God's door once and twice. We even knock it gently. Say, men ought to pray and not to faint. Say, pray without ceasing. Blind Bartimaeus could not be stopped. People were telling him, stop shouting, stop screaming. He said, you don't know anything. You've not had noise. One person screamed louder than others, trying to shout him down. And Jesus stood still. He said, bring him. You will get God's attention this month. The woman with the issue of blood got divine attention through resolute faith. Mark 5 verse 30. Mark 5 verse 30. He said, if only I can touch the M of the garment. The Bible says he did. He touched the M of the garment. And in verse 30, the Bible says, and Jesus immediately, knowing himself, in himself, that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Will you touch him with faith? Believing in him absolutely. Paul and Silas got divine attention through midnight praises. When was the last time you woke up in the midnight to pray? When was the last time you just said, today I'm not going to ask God about anything. I just want to praise his holy name. When was the last time? Acts 16 verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And when they found out that they are not getting the attention of God. They switched from prayer and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners had them. It's the reason we praise God lavishly by the grace of God here. Last December, we did 49 hours of prayer, seven hours every day for seven days, before 24 hours of praise for seven days. You must get God's attention. Those who get the attention of God, you do something that appears crazy. And God comes down. And when God come down, come, comes down, <laughs> you can be sure that there will be rest. Finally, one out of ten lepers got attention through appreciation or thanksgiving. Luke 17, verse 17. Jesus had healed ten lepers. The nine just went away. That is God. He can do all things. Why should anybody be excited about God doing a miracle? So, but one said, no, I will go back and show my appreciation. And in verse 17, Jesus allowed me to say lamented and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? He paid, it did matter paid him. Where are they? In other words, he was expecting them to come back and say thank you. How many miracles have you enjoyed? How many of them have you shared? So, well, it's not a big deal. It's just, I used to have, you know, it's this headache, but now I don't see the headache again. 
Oh, it's the money that I owe, but now I've paid it, but um, that's okay. Jesus is saying, we are there not ten cleansed. Where are they now? Brethren, it's a month of rest on every side. It will be your testimony in the name of Jesus. If your road is rocky and muddy, you need a way. Run to him. Make sure your children are not going to travel on rocky and muddy ways. Pave the ways for them. And then, of course, it's important to call for divine attention. Say, look at this, my matter, Lord. However, eternal rest is in Christ. Because for David, even though he warred throughout, the trouble to the left, trouble everywhere, the Bible says the Lord put them under the sole of his feet. And it's reigning with the Lord Jesus. The Lord can put an end to wars if we allow him. He will give us rest this month in the name of Jesus. But for a permanent rest, you need Christ in your life. The life without Christ will be full of crisis. I mean, how can you be coming to a church like this one for one month? And you know you are not born again. You know it yourself. There was somebody I was asking, say, hey, Pastor, I'm not born again. Ah. So how long have you been here? Say, have you been here? Ah. <laughs> but at least the man is honest. There are many people who are not born again. When you ask us, I'm born again, ah, Pastor, how far long ago? I'm born again. Say, but your wife just said you are caught in adultery. It's only once a while. So if you are not saved, today is the day. Because the life without Christ will be in crisis. The Bible says there is no rest for the wicked. Let's rise.